Hi, it's Nate again. Uh, we're going to talk about energy in the economy in this week's Nexus. Our culture uh, really doesn't see energy as anything special. We are energy blind. We tend to look at the economy in terms of technology and money. When it's energy and materials, natural resources that really are the drivers of our modern economy, here's a whirlwind look at how all these pieces fit together. Okay, here's a simple model of the human ecosystem. As you can see, the log derivative of consumption relative to... I'm just kidding. Okay. The above diagram is a simple description of our modern economy. We come up with ideas and inventions. We create technology which combines human labor with energy and renewable and non-renewable resources. We turn that into products... Our commercial banks create new money that represents the value of these products. And then we buy and use these products and services to seek experiences that give us similar emotional states to those which motivated our ancestors. This entire process results in economic output and it generates waste. And then we repeat the entire loop at a bigger scale, growth. This is the human ecosystem simplified. Last week we described how many of the behaviors we pursue in the modern world are an attempt to replicate similar emotional states of our ancestors. This week we're going to take a brief look at how this modern economy functions with a focus on the central importance of energy, particularly fossil energy. Let's start in nature. In a basic biological sense, animals in the wild are investors they get a return for their investment of time and energy finding and chasing prey. Both the return and the cost are measured in energy terms, in calories. Those animals with very high caloric payoff strategies will have excess energy for metabolism, cellular repair, mating, and raising offspring. This amount of surplus energy over its energy cost is the currency of life. Humans and all human-created systems are subject to these same natural energy limits. The amount of energy surplus our societies have dictates how much work we have to do and what we can accomplish. The last couple thousand years, humans expanded around the globe, improving farming techniques and increasing the surplus provided us from the sun, soil, water, and land. But we started to run into limits in the 18th century. We were running out of ways to generate enough surplus for the wants and needs of so many people from biomass alone. It was around then we puzzled out how to access the dense energy found in fossil carbon and hydrocarbons. Crude oil and its cousins natural gas and coal are ancient solar productivity that we apply today in massive amounts to the human ecosystem. In what has been a very brief time in human history, we're tapping Earth's battery, which has been charging for hundreds of millions of years. Doing this effectively adds armies of cheap labor to our economies. The story of the benefits these armies provide for us is not widely understood or appreciated yet. But what these carbon armies do for us has been indistinguishable from magic on any human time scale. You've heard of the Industrial Revolution, which started a couple hundred years ago. This is when humans began to add vast amounts of cheap fossil energy to power machines that did the tasks humans used to do by hand or with draft animals. Machines plus cheap energy could create many more textiles at a cheaper cost or power trains of cargo and people far faster and cheaper than we could do manually or with wood. Let's look at a modern and personal example. This is my farm in Wisconsin. This is me in my fashionable socks. I can do the work of about one-eighth of a horse. This is my horse, Binga, who can do the work of one horse. This is my utility vehicle, which does the work of 45 horses. And this is my truck, with a little bit of gasoline, can do the work of 300 horses. If you ride in a commercial jet... Imagine 100,000 invisible horses pulling that airline across the sky. That's how powerful jet fuel is. 
Compared to what we used to do merely with human and animal labor, we can do way more using energy-dense hydrocarbons. Effectively, one barrel of oil does 4.5 years worth of human manual labor, all for around $60. Imagine picking up four of your buddies, stopping at a gas station, and for around $40, fill up your 20-gallon car tank and head to the countryside. You drive for hours, watching the scenery roll by and having fun. After 500 miles or so, your vehicle rolls to a stop, it's out of fuel. How many hours, days, weeks would it take the four of you to push your truck back to your starting point in Minneapolis 500 miles away? Well, if the road was reasonably flat and you had reasonably good weather and you were reasonably strong, you might push the truck two miles per hour. Doing that 10 hours today, it would take you a month to push it back to where you started. How much would you have to pay your buddies to do such a boring, difficult, and unpleasant task? Even at a minimum wage of $10 an hour, it would cost you over $6,000 and a month of time and probably several friendships. All that time and labor and enjoyment you got for 40 bucks. This trade of replacing tasks humans used to do manually with technology and vast amounts of cheap fossil energy has rippled through our economies in the form of higher wages, higher profits, lower price stuff, and via cheap fertilizer being applied to increase land productivity, more food, and thus more people. Every single good and service in the modern economy requires an energy conversion, which means the size and the scale of our modern human endeavor is completely linked to and dependent on our available energy. Let's take a look at the composition and scale of modern human energy use. This is a chart of global energy use the last 200 years. Up until the end of the 20th century, you can see the beige on the bottom, which is biomass, comprise most of the energy that humans use. Then we started to use coal in the gray stripe, oil in the green, natural gas in the red, hydroelectric in the blue, nuclear in the green, followed by other renewables like solar and wind in the yellow. You can see that we added these new energy sources on top of what we used before to grow the size and the scale of the human economy. Okay, but how much is this now for a modern average American? If you divide the total amount of oil used each year in the USA by our population of 320 million people, each of us uses about 20 barrels of oil. If you include the energy equivalent of coal and natural gas, this equals 57 barrels per person per year and another 15 to 20 barrels that are burned in other countries that make products that we import and consume. This equates to a total of 70 barrels of oil per person of energy. In coal terms, this equates to 25,000 pounds of coal per American per year. Think about it. How much energy is this? Consider a 100 watt light bulb turned on all the time. The average American currently has an energy metabolism equal to 100 of these light bulbs turned on 24 seven. Historically, most of the calories our ancestors consumed were in their bodies called endosomatic consumption. But because of our access to the bonanza of condensed ancient sunlight, Today, 99% of American energy use is exosomatic, outside the body, via cars, airplanes, heat, light, imported food, buildings, etc. The average American eats around 2,500 calories today, around six Big Macs, but our exosomatic consumption outside the body is equal to over 400 Big Macs worth of calories every day. And this is about four to five times the world average. To put this in college student terms, that's almost 600 packages of ramen noodles. So many ramen noodles. Looked at from an economic lens, the benefits from industrialization in the past two centuries have been breathtaking. Measured by consumption of goods and services, human wealth increased over 13 times for the average human and 21 times for the average American since the year 1800. In fact, if you combine this per capita increase 
with our population increase now at 7.6 billion humans, the scale of the human economy is now 400 times larger than it was just 500 years ago. Metabolically, we are not 180 pound human men and women. Americans have an energy metabolism equal to 30 ton animals. Globally, if we add up the 100 billion barrels of oil equivalent of fossil energy we use annually in the global economy, this equals around 500 billion human laborers worth of work. We only pay for the extraction cost, not the creation nor the pollution from the main input to human economies. Okay, first, no, oil is not dinosaur blood. Crude oil, which is where heating oil, diesel, gasoline, asphalt, and many other products originate, was formed from phytoplankton, algae, and other microscopic organisms that were buried under sediments in areas that were ancient oceans, then heated and condensed over tens and hundreds of millions of years. Coal is mainly ancient terrestrial plants that underwent similar processes. Just as in nature, the benefits from various energy sources decline as the cost to obtain them increase. Assuming the same investment, a predator will have much less surplus energy for survival and reproduction if it shifts from gazelles to rabbits to mice. In the same fashion, humans have gone from accessing the easiest and cheapest and least environmentally damaging fossil carbon first. As we go from the just under the surface gusher wells to platforms in the Gulf of Mexico to heating the oil-infused sand called tar sands in Canada, the benefits to human economies diminish as our costs increase. So here are two completely different narratives about the United States and global oil situation. And they even use the same charts. The chart on the left shows... U.S. oil production the last 70 years, we peaked in the 1970s, declined, and now we've pierced that peak due to technology. The graph on the right is the exact same graph broken out by field and region. The conventional oil in the green peaked in 1970 has largely been in decline. That's the very cheap oil. The yellow band is the north slope of Alaska, the blue is the offshore Gulf of Mexico oil, and the red is light tight oil, which you hear about as shale oil in the Bakken, Marcellus, and Permian. This is very costly. It averages around $55 to $60 to break even, and it depletes between 85 and 90% in the first 36 months. This is the source rock where all this other oil originated. Simply put, our access to fossil carbon is not unlimited, and we've already found and used the cheapest and easiest. There's plenty of it left, but it's going to be more costly in energy, dollar, and environmental terms. If we look from a 20,000-year bird's-eye view, we now exist during a one-time carbon pulse where we extract various low-entropy materials from the earth to keep our industrial society going, from metal ores to fossil hydrocarbons. There remain plenty of resources, but their cost in energy and environmental terms means the coming century will look different than the last. Well, what about alternative energy? Well, not all energy is equal. Fossil energy is qualitatively different than alternative forms of energy. The calories in some flower petals might be equal to the calories in a grasshopper. But a hummingbird is uniquely suited to getting nectar from flowers and couldn't easily switch to grasshoppers even if they were abundant. In the same way, our current global industrial infrastructure has specific requirements and constraints and is particularly dependent on energy-dense liquid fuels. We've just went through a 150-year period of going from 100% renewables down to 5 or 10% renewables, and now we have to gradually, but inevitably, make the transition back again. This energy transition will present many constraints and opportunities, enough to fill many hours of video. Briefly, here are some of the challenges with a partial or full switch to renewables. 
We now make devices that channel and concentrate flows of energy from the sun. We refer to this as renewable energy. This technology is mature, has gotten affordable, and can generate a great deal of low carbon energy. But solar panels and wind turbines tap continual flows from wind and sun using mechanisms which need to repeatedly be rebuilt using materials, energy, and infrastructure. The mechanisms themselves are no more renewable than a pickup truck. An oak tree is renewable. A chicken is renewable. They can reproduce themselves based on solar and hydrological flows and finding another chicken. A Prius and a wind tower aren't renewable. They're rebuildable. Point number two. It is a non-trivial truism that humans demand energy at all sorts of times, but the sun isn't always out and the wind doesn't always blow. This is called intermittence. There's an inherent mismatch between demanding 24-7 access to energy and the timing and scale of what the sun provides. Point number three. The vast majority of renewable technology produces electricity which is a very high quality and useful energy form. But our current societal energy use is only around 20% electric. The rest is heat, transportation, aviation, etc. Yes, we can switch over some of the processes, but at a cost. Many processes might have to be changed or done without. It's going to be very difficult to power planes with electricity, to power freight cars, semi-trucks, cargo ships, the giant furnaces producing cement and steel, all with electricity affordably at scale. Point number four, about 75% of the 8 billion barrels of crude oil used annually in the United States is used to produce gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and heating oil. The other 25% results in a diverse array of petroleum products, crayons, heart valves, telephones, Mattresses, helmets, glasses, toilet seats, fertilizer, aspirin, fishing poles, shampoo, paints, tires, condoms, luggage, tents, lipstick, ammonia, and many other manufacturing chemicals, asphalt, and more. There is no simple or cheap non-fossil substitute for most of these products. Okay, so what is all this energy for anyways? Well, energy is nearly everything, but once our basic needs are met, we get increasingly smaller benefits from more. In general, research shows that a reasonable level of well-being on objective measures is achievable between 50 and 70 gigajoules per capita, with then only marginal increases up to 100 gigajoules per capita. As a comparison, North America is currently at 340 gigajoules per capita. The large excess consumption is not improving objective well-being or happiness. The same energy dynamic correlates with income as well. Countries with over 10 times the average income and energy use as poorer countries with high social capital are not any happier. After basic needs are met, community, shared ordeals and challenges, nature, pride, etc. contribute more to our happiness and enjoyment of life. It's important to consider that out of the 100 light bulbs worth of energy used by the average American day in and day out, the first couple of them provide amazing benefits. One or two of these 100 watt light bulbs worth of energy will charge a phone or a laptop. A few more will provide heat and light. By the time we get to our 20th or 30th light bulb worth, most of us are probably not getting huge incremental benefits. And this is ultimately very good news for our collective future because it means we can reduce consumption as individuals and as a society without necessarily reducing happiness and well-being. Okay, this has been a very quick whirlwind overview of energy. Here are the five main points. Number one, energy is central in nature and to human economies. Number two, fossil carbon energy massively subsidize our current living standards. Number three, we are living in the middle of a one-time carbon pulse. Number four, different energy types have very different properties, benefits, and costs. And number five, after basic needs are met, more personal energy use doesn't make one happier. When I learned about energy and how it underpins our life, I was kind of shocked that 
going throughout all of my schooling up until I was 22 years old, I had never learned about this. I had never been introduced to the reality that energy underpins every single thing that we do. And the greater reality beyond that, that it's not free. There is a cost to using these resources and they are finite. They are depleting and we will not have them forever and we will not be able to live the same way because they will no longer exist. And I think it's really important that we also recognize that there's no cost associated with using them. The way that we live now has a huge environmental cost to it. And those resources are not reflected in the prices of any of the products or services that we consume. And it's a really dangerous mindset to be in. So before I started learning this content, I was extremely bullish on renewable energy. I've listened to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talk about how we're going to keep growing the economy and also get to net zero emissions within 10 years. And while I appreciate the sentiment of the Green New Deal, I think that that is just simply inaccurate and misleading. I mean, the fact is, if you look at the steel and cement that makes up the building I'm sitting in right now, it's not going to be cost effective in any reasonable timeline to make those without fossil fuels. What I think is essential that we all understand is that while renewables are extremely important, if we really want to solve the environmental problems, we can't just keep growing this giant economy further and further. We can, even with renewables, we can't just keep this economy surging forward forever. We're going to need to change our patterns of consumption along with renewables if we really want to create a change. I hope at a minimum this short video made you aware of the influence and the importance of energy in your lives. Energy, hopefully, is no longer invisible to you. Additionally, perhaps you can better appreciate the massive benefits energy gives our current society and think about how a future of more costly and less available energy might affect your own field of study and career. Here's some questions for your Nexus group. Did you learn anything new about energy in this video which did not match up with your previous understanding or beliefs about energy? What are some activities or things you do in your own life that are not energy intensive but bring you joy, meaning, or happiness?